For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today to discuss a book on Rosemary Lovo is investigative journalist Naledi Shange. Welcome, Naledi. Hello, Sane. Thank you for having me. So, Rosemary Lovo made headlines for all the wrong reasons. Give us just a brief uh, overview of her crimes and tell us what prompted you to even go as far as writing a book after you have, were attending the court cases. Mm. Um, Rosemary Ndlovu was a police officer who was based at the Tembisa South Police Station. Um, and uh, she was arrested in March of 2018. She was accused of uh, numerous crimes, but most of these were actually murder, the murder of her family members. She was accused of killing six people, five of her relatives and her lover, Morris Mabasa. Now, the trial started in um, 2021, and I started following the trial, and uh, that's when I, uh, I had an interest in who this woman was, and I started mm -hmm. to dig um, deeper into who she was, where she comes from, and that um, is what resulted in this book. Mm. And her story is almost similar to the one uh, of a nurse called a Daisy Demelka, mm. who also poisoned her husband and his son. Talk us through that comparison. Yeah. Um, Daisy Demelka, as you said, was a nurse who used her, her knowledge of medicine in order to poison her son and, as well as um, her husband. And, that's how, and it was so that she could cash out on insurance policies. Mm. Now, Rosemary Ndlovo was a police officer and she knew the ins and outs of how the police worked. And so she used her knowledge as a police officer to plot the killings of her relatives. Um, we know that uh, during the trial, it was revealed that she had approached hitmen um, to help her in, in conducting some of the these crimes. Mm -hmm. Now one of these hitmen was um, somebody that she had arrested previously on a gun related charge and so she recruited this person to help her to murder her sister as well as her five kids. Mm -hmm. So that's where the comparison comes in. It's people who use their professions in mm -hmm. order to, to carry out certain crimes and like Daisy Demelker, Rosemary's biggest motivation for committing these crimes was insurance policies. Mm -hmm. We know that um, over the six year period that she committed these crimes, she cashed in about 1.4 million rand. But the woman was also um, a gambler. Tell us about that act addiction? Mm. Um, when I was doing my investigations of Rosemary, I tried to find out what actually makes a person a killer, what mm. motivated Rosemary. And uh, gambling was one of the things that came up when I spoke to um, former colleagues of hers who said she loved the slot machines. Mm. She was a regular at Empress Palace. Um, we also found out that she was highly in debt with loan sharks. But at the same time, there were other um, aspects that came in, such as greed. People just said Rosemary was a person who always liked to have her pockets lined. And therefore, whenever she was low on cash, it seemed as though that was when she'd start plotting um, the murder of the next um, victim. Victory. Yeah. And But then there were also other aspects that came through when I did my investigations on what led Rosemary to commit uh, these crimes. And some of the things that came up was that perhaps it was the result of a curse. I spoke to a family member of hers via Facebook who said that Rosemary may be in fact carrying out these killings because of something that's beyond her, a curse that was bestowed upon her um, mm. way before she was even in her teenage years. Mm. So, yeah. And uh, a lot of people who have not read the book uh, will be shocked if they were to hear how Rosemary was brought up and the setup of her family. Uh, Rosemary was born from a lesbian couple. Mm. Her mother had been married to a female Sangoma who is uh, from Julesburg. Mm. And uh, that's how she and her sister Audrey uh, were born. And then her mother left that relationship and went on to marry um, somebody that we uh, later learned to be Mr. Ndlovu. Now Mr. Ndlovu was somebody who was more than 40 years older than Rosemary's mother. And Rosemary's other siblings were born from that marriage. Um, I went to Bushburg Ridge where the Global kids were essentially raised. Mm. It was a, an area of deep poverty, um, if I can say so. It's a village in deep um, um, Bushback Ridge where um, when I spoke to the community members, they said to me that they were really proud of Rosemary at first because she seemed like she was the poster child of success, mm. having come from a village that had, had, that, uh, that had um, no tar roads, that still used pit toilets, where people um, were still basically um, getting by through through gardening and all of that and selling vegetables and fruits. So Rosemary seemed to have been the poster child for success who made it out of Bushbuck Ridge and had made a life for herself in Johannesburg. And, and a lot of people had looked up to her in her community. Mm. And you have an idea, as you've just told her, that you spoke to a few family members. Are they still shocked about this or were they suspecting that she had anything to do with some of these crimes? It depends on who you speak to mm -hmm. in terms of Rosemary's family members. Um, 
one of the people that I spoke to was Rosemary's sister, Joyce. Now, we know that when Rosemary was arrested in March of 2018, she was arrested on the day that she was supposed to have mm. killed her sister, or she had hired people to kill her sister, um, Joyce. Joyce was supposed to have burnt in her house along with five children. So Joyce has, um, in my interactions with her, I found that she was somebody who was deeply pained by the actions of her sister. She she believes that her sister was indeed um, uh, capable of capable of doing oh. all the yeah. things that um, she was accused of doing, although she was quite hurt by it. I spoke to Rosemary's mother, on the other hand, who, although there was evidence that was presented in court that Rosemary had plotted to kill her as well, did not believe that her daughter was capable of any of these crimes. So now tell us about uh, her husband's uh, family, because when I read the book, they were also suspecting that she had something to do with his death. Um, her very first husband was Hand Causa. Rosemary and Hand got married very early on. She was quite young when she married Hand mm -hmm. Causa. And um, during their marriage, uh, she expressed her interest in getting into the police force. And he gave her his blessing um, to go and uh, go into the police force. And the family just described how Rosemary changed as soon as uh, she started working as a police officer. How her husband had longed for her to come home and be the dutiful wife um, that he had married. But she never came home. Um, what happened? happened was Hand fell extremely sick mm -hmm. and at that time the family was expecting Rosemary to come back home and take care of her husband but she didn't come home and it was the same thing even when he passed on mm -hmm. and uh, when I spoke to the family they said they saw things that happened shortly after he died that made them believe that she may have had a hand in his mm -hmm. death as well and then shortly thereafter it was just a couple of years after that um, their son uh, Rosemary and Hand's son whose name was John T. Causa, also died under mysterious circumstances mm -hmm. when he was in Johannesburg visiting Rosemary for the school holidays. Mm -hmm. So the family, sitting down with them and discussing the case as it unfolded, they said to me that, you know what, perhaps a lot of us also dodged a bullet by having Rosemary leave um, as soon as Hand died, although they were not very happy to see how she had left the family mm -hmm. as soon as her husband had passed away. Yeah, and she even sold the house that he built. Which yes. Was also like bizarre. Mm -hmm. Now, now, uh, one of the the murders that were carried out uh, by Rosemary is the death of a sister, Audrey, which was like shocking, and mm. I I really had a hard time reading that chapter mm. because of how she had planned everything, and at the same time she also left a few like loopholes, if I may say. Mm. Can you tell us what happened to her sister? Um, in terms of Audrey, as you're correct, I think Audrey's death was one that also disturbed me quite a lot because you think of how personal that killing was. Mm -hmm. Now, Audrey and Rosemary um, share a mother and a father. Um, remember what I told you about mm -hmm. how they had been born to this lesbian couple mm -hmm. and, and all of that. Um, how Audrey died was that she was poisoned and it's believed that Rosemary had poisoned Audrey herself. Mm -hmm. And then when she realized a couple of hours later that Audrey had not died, she is believed to have strangled Audrey to death mm -hmm. herself. And then after that, um, from my investigations and speaking to people who, who were involved in the trial, it seemed as though Rosemary wanted it to be sped up so that um, Audrey's body could be quickly found so that she could start claiming mm -hmm. on all these insurance policies. So you're right about her being careless in terms of covering up that, that scene mm -hmm. because we saw things um, like uh, the cups that contained the poison tea that were she left on the scene. Yes, those. yes. She quickly washed those in the, in the presence of the police and all mm -hmm. of that. So it was little things that led to her um, essentially being nabbed as mm. the, the main suspect and, mm. well, essentially the killer of uh, her sister Audrey. And when she began at the trial, she was a bit entertaining and later changed as uh, information was unfolding. And I think that's when she saw that this was serious and she had no chance of getting out. Tell us about those days. Mm. It was actually quite weird to see that side of Rosemary because mm -hmm. at first I started attending the trial and there were no other journalists in court, I think for the, like the first week or so. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary was normal. She sat um, in the dock, she just took down her notes, she would um, interact with her lawyer and that is how she, she was. That was how she conducted herself. But as soon as the, ma the mainstream media came in, I'm talking about your television cameras and mm -hmm. your photographers came in, I saw a completely different side of Rosemary where she started to, to thrive of all of this attention, where her makeup was now 
were on point. Her hair was changing on a regular and she enjoyed the media attention that was all on her. But it didn't last long because we saw that as soon as she took to the stand and she was put in the corner by the state prosecutor, Rihanna Williams, mm -hmm. another side of Rosemary came out where she was now defensive and she was not so welcoming of the media anymore. And I remember there was one point where she tried to even assault a journalist. Um, and after that, she would come to court with her handcuffs and all of that. And, mm -hmm. and she just became somebody else and she was no longer as receptive of the media as she was at first. So there were just different elements that came through from Rosemary. Some which made me think that perhaps she's playing this, these games so that she could later perhaps put in a, a, a plea of mm. some mental mm. condition. But it never happened. Her lawyers never brought that to the fore. And it seemed like she did everything that she was doing purposefully. Because even now, as another case of hers unraveled in the Kempton Park Magistrates Court, we've continued to see the same thing. When mm. Rosemary appears in court, she appears with her makeup, her heels, and she plays to the gallery. She plays to the media gallery. Gallery, and she enjoys all of that, all of that attention. Mm. Are mm. we likely to see another book, maybe a follow-up, oh. perhaps after speaking to the woman? Herself? I would love that. I would love the opportunity um, to to speak to Rosemary. This book, although it has Rosemary Global's name on the cover, I mm. think that it delves quite a lot into the lives of her victims, and that's where the story ties in. Mm. So while the book does touch on Rosemary's background and who she is, the book is actually an ode to all of her victims. Mm. So if I were to have an opportunity to write a second book, it would be a book where I could sit down with Rosemary mm. and have these discussions with her, have it come from her own mouth about her experiences with all of these people, mm. and maybe who knows, maybe she could tell us what drove her to this, because we know that up until the very end, she denied even having anything to do with the killings of all of these people. But at the same time, she never pointed the court in the right direction of who, if not her, perhaps was behind all of these killings. Mm. And uh, because she cashed out on a lot of money, did you hear of any like lavish lifestyle that <sighs> Rosemary was living? Not really. Mm. I know that at one point they said she had a nice car, but she lost that apparently to a loan shark. Um, Rosemary was renting a house um, around Tembisa in the Clayville, Tembisa Clayville mm -hmm. area. Um, so she didn't even have a house to her name. But what I do know is that some of the money that she had, it seemed she used it to take care of her mother back at home um, in Bushbuck Ridge. Because when I went to the house, the house was a little bit better than others in that area. It had been just mm. fixed up just a little bit, not it, nothing worth 1.4 million rand. And even when I went in there, the furniture wasn't expensive looking furniture. So um, the theory is that Rosemary lost a lot of that money to the slot machines. But you know, as it said, easy come, easy mm. go. So that mm. could have also been um, a result of that. I remember um, during the court case when um, the judge asked her about some of the money that she received after Maurice Mabasa, her lover, was killed. She was asked, what did you do with some of that money? And she spoke about how she had installed a Jojo tank for Maurice's mother and had put in a fence for her. But all of that is, is nothing close to mm. the money that she received. Mm. Thank you very much, Naledi, for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it, Sunny. That was Naledi Shange in conversation with Polity, discussing her book titled Killer Cop, The Rosemary Glover Story.